After five decades of dominance in popular music, in the 2010s the landscape for rock music was decidedly bleak. Coming out of the 2000s, a decade whose early years were dominated by down-tempo, sour, sludgy new metal, quickly followed by the dominance of sneering pop punks and emo kids, the genre seemed to be in flux. Fading fast from mainstream relevance and fracturing into an ever-increasing number of insular subgenres that further diluted the prospective audience for new acts, it was fair to wonder if it could ever recover from falling off its previous perch atop the music industry hierarchy. That is, until 2012, when a seemingly random series of events led to an explosion in alternative acts topping the charts. This time, though, the bands behind these tracks had traded the previously in vogue sad boy images for what can best be described as a pastiche of 80s synth rock mixed with some modern pop sensibilities. Neon Tree scored a smash with Everybody Talks, Fun had multiple songs end up on the year on Top 100, but perhaps the most prescient harbinger of what was to come came in the form of Imagine Dragons' It's Time landing at number 91. The following year, the Las Vegas outfit exploded, landing Radioactive at number 3, as well as notching two more songs on the year-end list. Often derided for what many see as a lack of depth in their lyricism, in addition to singer Dan Reynolds' curious and at times grating use of falsetto, Imagine Dragons had solidified themselves as the most successful, but also most controversial rock band of the decade. A fair number of imitators would follow in the footsteps of these trailblazing acts, fusing modern pop with just enough guitar and organic drum sounds to be considered crossover rock acts, rather than pure pop experiences, to varying degrees of quality and success. It's fair to ask at this stage what my intention with the history lesson is here. Well, context is key. It's within this environment that a group of British lads would set out to carve their names on the modern pop rock landscape, in the process becoming one of the more polarizing musical acts of the 2010s, especially among those well-versed in internet music discourse. The 1975 was formed sometime around 2003 by school friends Matt Healy, Adam Hahn, Ross McDonald, and George Daniel in Manchester, England. Early in their career, the band experimented with a number of band names, genres, and sounds. As you may expect, given the climate of the times, they began as an emo punk band who spent their after-school hours covering early Fall Out Boy and Coheed and Camry songs, as well as eventually writing a couple of their own tracks, relying heavily on teenage angst and energy for much of the lyrical themes and vocal delivery. Frontman Matty Healy often would try putting an American affect into his singing, evoking a poor man's imitation of Taking Back Sunday's Adam Lazara or the early stylings of Gerard Way. A few early demos from this period are floating around the internet, the standouts being Cobra Kai Never Dies and Liu Kang vs. Ryu, a pair of up-tempo cuts that are very rough around the edges but do give a window into the group's core strengths, namely having a top caliber drummer in George Daniel, as well as having an innate sense for a melodic hook, whether on bass, guitar, or in the vocals. As with most things, with age came refinement, and it's around the time they adopt the moniker Drive Like I Do, the band we know today is really starting to come together. The songs are slickly produced pop rock numbers, trading in distortion for chorus and screaming and yelping for falsetto and catchy hey hos most exemplified by the tune Lost Boys, a less refined version of the formula they would lean heavily on in years to come. Finally settling on the 1975 nameplate, the group released a series of well-received EPs in the underground bedroom pop scene. These records would see the boys experiment with synthetic elements, tracks like Antichrist and Me being these angsty synth soundscapes that sees Healy write dark ramblings about depression, suicidal ideation, and anxiety. Interspersed with instrumental electronic cuts, tracks like Chocolate, Sex, and The City all make their first appearances. These projects were often more drawn out than necessary, with many of the soundscape slash instrumental cuts feeling like filler, but the core of the band's identity has taken shape by this point. The hooks have arrived in full force, and Healy has undergone a notable upgrade in his vocal delivery, opting for a reggae slash funk influenced cadence that allows him to string together a veritable word salad of lyrics into rhythmically enticing vocal hooks, making what he's actually saying an afterthought in the broader sonic context of these tracks. By the time 2013's self-titled record was released, the group had polished themselves to a mirror shine. The choruses were catchy, the drums punchy and cleverly layered with artificial elements, the bass lines tight, and every guitar lead meticulously calculated to get lodged at the base of your skull with no means for escape. The step up in production also finally lent the sense of true bombast and scale befitting of the band's attitude and image. Lyrically, the record does not deviate much from the adolescent formula of some of their earlier more juvenile emo material, but Healy had refined his writing in such a way that he came across as a suave, smooth-talking, intelligent bad boy type that, when coupled with the band's aesthetic at the time, leather jackets, etc., made him a favorite among teenage girls and catapulted the band into mainstream success. And it was a perfect storm. Simultaneous to the rise of Imagine Dragons and Fun, there was a growing amount of momentum in the industry to bring back the concept of the traditional boy band, with acts like One Direction and The Wanted seeing huge sales and airplay around the same time the 1975 broke big with Chocolate. 
With his bad boy image, slick styling, and clever marketing concepts, Healy and company managed to catch both waves at once, attracting the boy band crowd while also having the tunes to back up their credibility as legitimate performers. Unlike some of their more cookie-cutter competition in the pretty boy Tumblr space, a dichotomy that didn't go unnoticed by Healy, who would perfectly encapsulate the key to his success in a line from Give Yourself a Try later in his career, quote, a millennial that baby boomers like. 2015's follow-up, I Like It When You Sleep For You Are So Beautiful Yet So Unaware Of It, was an even bigger smash. Seeing Healy lean more heavily on narcissism, drugs, and hedonistic attitude, the record produced some of the band's most successful songs, including Somebody Else and The Sound, as well as fan favorites like Change of Heart, a self-referential addendum to many of the themes explored on the first record. Sure, it was overly long, the title was pretty terrible, and some of the songs felt more like extended interludes made by people being a little too overly indulgent, but when the singles are that good, you forgive stuff like that. Around this time, Healy and George Daniel take over full creative control of the production process from an engineering and mixing standpoint, choosing to work in-house rather than with outside producers. It's at this point where I believe the foundation of the 1975 becomes cracked, and over the course of the next nine years, that crack would grow to become fatal. The issue, much like water creeping into a house's foundation, had existed from the outset. On the earliest EPs which were produced in their bedrooms, the band's penchants for self-indulgence manifesting in overly long instrumental diatribes and experiments was written off as merely a growing pain when their self-titled came out with a tightly sequenced track list that didn't waste a moment of its runtime. I like it when you sleep indulged a lot of these impulses, to the album's detriment, but many, including myself, were willing to overlook it as the winning formula was still at play for the important moments. What made the 1975 such a compelling act, regardless of their musical skill, was their ability to create a grandiose artifice without swallowing themselves whole. It's a time-honored tradition for rock frontmen to be over the top in their presentation and attitude, and Healy was no different. In fact, in contrast to the empty shells that fronted bands like Fun and Imagine Dragons, Healy cultivated his inflated sense of self as one of the group's defining attributes. Especially evident on tracks like Love Me, The Sound, Girls, and Settle Down, Healy's ability to frame his personality and life experiences into extensions of the arrogant, swagger-drenched bad boy in a leather jacket, while keeping just enough elements of grounded realism to reel in middle American teens longing for some kind of fantasy of love, excess, and power that's actually attainable, was key to his success. The linchpin for me in this is, while doing all of this, he makes a calculated effort to avoid anything that would pass for true autobiographical storytelling or oversharing. Songs like Robbers and Sex read as pure fantasy, while Chocolate and the City are intentionally vague, left to be evocative of feeling and a time and place in someone's life and development, rather than true storytelling. Dedicated fans will point to tracks like the first record's closing number, Is There Someone Who Can Watch You, or Paris from the second record as clearly being framed as personal stories. While that may be the case, the latter is actually a perfect example of the way Healy can layer artifice in with reality to create a phenomenal end result. The second line of the songs reads, quote, we, we share friends in Soho. Immediately before the first verse is even over, he has already put distance between his audience and his life, clearly delineating the ways in which his life is more glamorous and privileged. While the lyrics do deal with his personal struggles, he maintains a level of separation between his audience's experiences and his own, which is what makes him a compelling performer. That all changed with the group's 2017 release, A Brief Inquiry into Online Relationships. In the lead-up, Healy entered rehab for his addiction to heroin and other drugs. His stint in rehab and the lifestyle changes he made as a result loom large over the whole project, mostly in the lyrical content, but also with the much darker and dour tone the record takes on as it sprawls over 15 songs and nearly an hour's worth of runtime. Where the previous record was held together on the strength of its singles, this project falls apart directly because of its distinct lack of the kind of hooks, melodic content, and attitude you would have anticipated from the 1975. Even the songs that are supposed to fill that role end up sounding like cheap imitations of what came before. Making matters worse, the record's runtime is needlessly cluttered with winding instrumental detours like How to Draw a Petrichor and Man Who Married a Robot, cuts that would have been on the chopping block had the band been working within a traditional label, management, or production structure. Instead, the band has been empowered at this point to make any decision, no matter how out of left field it is, in the name of, quote, artistic vision. It's not just the experiments that contribute to this record's failings, however. Be My Mistake is a confession taking the form of a low-tempo, finger-picked acoustic ballad nestled in a bed of the nameless, shapeless, vaguely piano-ish sounds that weave their way throughout the majority of songs across this project. It sees Healy exploring his guilt around infidelity. In years gone by, he would tackle a subject like this in one of two ways. Grand celebrations of his hedonism with framing making it ambiguous as to which party is at fault, or with a kind of bitter energy that could be harnessed for a slower but more emotive track in the vein of some of the material from the early EPs, You comes to mind in particular. 
Instead, in a jarring change of pace, Healy opts for the kind of brutal, blunt, occasionally cringy storytelling that one might expect out of Dashboard Confessional, Weezer, or any number of shy, awkward, charismaless characters that littered late 90s and early 2000s. Likening the smell of his mistress's hair to that of his girlfriend's feet, and dwelling on mundane details like the origin of the jeans he's wearing, all while using a vocal affectation that can best be described as evoking a pervert watching you through your window, the song meanders through its over four minute runtime and leaves the listener with an altogether unflattering portrait of its narrator. I have no doubt that that was Healy's intent when writing it. The problem is, it's completely antithetical to everything that he had been previously, and, much like when water breaches the outer shell of an abandoned building, he had begun the slow decay and rot of the artifice he had worked so hard to cultivate and which was key to the success the band enjoyed in early years. At the time of the album's release, I wrote this off as a largely one-off mistake, mostly due to the rest of the record choosing to focus on either more disconnected political topics or more esoteric ideas like surrounded by heads and bodies. It was only with the release of the follow-up Notes on a Conditional Form in 2020 that I knew that this formula had been broken beyond repair. Specifically, it was actually several months before the album proper was let out into the world with the release of the single The Birthday Party. A brutal, joyless slog that breaks the four and a half minute mark, the track winds its way through as many bland, unengaging stories as it can before truly throwing itself off a cliff when Healy inexplicably begins detailing his and his partner's embarrassing bathroom habits. The absolute last thing I want to hear anyone, let alone the 1975, sing about is their weird mental hangups over shitting in a shared bathroom. It's not clever, subversively shocking storytelling, and it's not raw and revealing, made ever more apparent by the seemingly apathetic tone in which Healy delivers it. No, what this signified to me was that, after years of relentless touring, committing to releasing two gargantuan albums in the space of a couple of years, and insulating the writing process to just a handful of people, Healy had finally done what many critics accused him of in years past. He disappeared firmly up his own ass and promptly ran out of any ideas he had left. When the album proper came out, those infamous lines in the birthday party were joined by these strange ramblings that make up roadkill, which remains fixated on bodily functions and generic details that don't make for good stories as much as they do creepy overshares from a man incapable of returning to the character and artifice he had cultivated on earlier albums. Which would be fine if he didn't seem straight up defiant about it. If there's one thing one walks away from any interview with Healy, it's that he could come across as a bit of a prick, and not in an endearing way. He fancies himself Tom York, and believes that he and George can create OK Computer between the two of them using the OP1 and some vocal loops. If he wants to be an arrogant, an asshole in interviews, fine. But when, like on Nothing Revealed, Everything Denied, you want to put a middle finger to your fan base and your past by recanting several of your more outlandish and grand proclamations from previous tracks in the name of being real and challenging our perception. It doesn't come across as honesty. It comes across almost as intentional self-sabotage in the vein of Eminem's widely ridiculed encore, which is seen by many as an intentional attempt at career suicide on the part of a man in the deep throes of drug addiction and a variety of personal battles. The one key difference, of course, is that Notes on a Conditional Form is Healy's first record where the majority of the material was worked on and completed while he was sober. It's fair to wonder to what extent Healy used drugs as a crutch to maintain the level of performance and artifice that were his calling cards at the height of their powers. Let's look at the birthday party a bit more closely. The track feels very much like it's either heavily influenced by or ripped basically whole cloth from the Pine Grove playbook, appropriate given that Healy inexplicably calls attention to the controversy surrounding that act in the song's first couple verses. Specifically, it feels like he took inspiration from one of Pine Grove's more popular tracks, Old Friends, a winding rollick through early adulthood angst and depression that works its way through a five minute runtime. The issue is, Healy didn't take any of the lyrical elements that make that song a compelling listen. Just compare these two verses from each song. Walking outside labyrinthian over Cracks along under the trees I know this town grounded in a compass Cardinal landing in the dogwood I keep going over it over and over My steps iterate my shame How come every outcome such a come down Lately afternoon with the shades drawn down
Both songs take the form of slice of life retellings of occurrences in one's life. Pine Grove focusing on the feelings of returning to your hometown, Healy's on a birthday party. Pine Grove chooses to be vague and evasive about what the demon he's running from actually takes the form of, using the little details of his day to enhance the feeling of malaise that surrounds his existence, leaving the reveal for the climactic third verse, and even then, leaving the intimate details to the side in favor of more generalized catharsis and solutions rather than hashing out what brought him to this point. Healy, by contrast, gets absolutely lost in meaningless details, meandering his way through stories of the actual birthday party, relationship issues, arguments over the state of the legitimacy of the art he bought. It reads not as a slice of life, but one's entire boring, privileged life laid out in front of him in an increasingly confused audience, begging for the grooves, attitude, and swagger that brought them to the table. A posh douchebag spilling his guts on stage only to realize that he had already digested the interesting bits and leaving stomach acid and clippings of his breakfast for fans and critics to dissect. The issues around the band's modern output aren't simply limited to lyrical content, however. Around the time of Healy's sobriety is when autotune goes from something used for one-off effect in carefully cultivated moments on earlier albums to being used across whole songs and in increasingly lazy ways. As Healy's writing decayed into its current nonsensical state, he increasingly turned away from his signature delivery, highlighted by punchy, high-pitched tone that would grab a listener's attention, even if a certain percentage would inevitably find it grating. On the latter two records of the band's catalog, Healy hides more and more often behind the veil of highly edited and pitch-shifted vocals. It reads like a man chafing at the hole he carved out for himself in popular consciousness, retreating into synthetic expression, manipulating his vocals and warping them into a shapeless void lacking humanity and personality, the logical extreme at the other end of the spectrum for what made him such a compelling figure. Just listen to the stark differences between these handful of tracks from the band's debut and then from Notes. especially like our last example, Nothing Revealed, Everything Denied, and Tonight I Wish I Was Your Boy, where this choice takes otherwise salvageable songs and adds a layer of gunk in between the gears that grinds everything to a halt and leaves you staring at your computer screen wondering what the fuck you just pressed play on. Most other bands would have a path out of this mid-career slump. There's plenty of notable acts that have pulled out of this sort of death spiral at the last minute, but there's several factors that are going to make that an exceedingly difficult challenge for the 1975. Firstly, years ago they dispensed with the traditional producer-artist relationship, opting to place production and songwriting solely in the hands of Daniel and Healy. After eight years and multiple chart-topping albums, how likely are they to give up that level of control? Then there's the small problem of their label. Dirty Hit functions essentially as an extension of the 1975 run by their manager Jamie Oburn, and providing seemingly no pushback to the increasingly harebrained ideas put forward by Healy, delaying notes over and over, leaking track lists that never come to pass, and just generally acting in an erratic fashion all come to mind. It seems far-fetched to think that the brain-trusted Dirty Hit would make any move without Healy's express say-so, so expecting them to be the voice of reason in all of this seems short-sighted. Finally, there's the matter of their continued sales. Notes on a conditional form immediately went to number one in multiple countries and on par or better with the numbers the band's previous works had. With no financial incentive to return to their previous formula and a stated distaste for critics' perceptions of their work, the avenue of change seems effectively closed. I'm rooting for Maddie and his band of merry men. 
I have so many memories and complicated emotions wrapped up in their material. I discovered them at a time when I was in the honeymoon phase of the most serious relationship I've ever had, and shared a love for songs like Robbers, Chocolate, and Girls with her before we eventually parted ways under kind of brutal circumstances, which led to songs like Somebody Else and Change of Heart hitting home all the more strongly. And, even in the context of an otherwise weak album, Love It If We Made It is still a vital addition to their arsenal, with Sincerity is Scary serving as a phenomenal groovy trip as well. I don't need or want them to just remake those songs again. What I want is for them to get back to doing what they do best, not trying to subvert our expectations, burn their previous reputation, or hide behind synthetic musical elements, but to create catchy hooks, pumping up the swagger to 11, and being an undeniable force in the boring, lifeless, mainstream rock scene. With the band teasing their fifth studio album in recent weeks, it seems we'll have an answer to our question soon enough. Has a year and a half off the road rejuvenated the gang into creating, as Healy puts it, another classic album, or have they faded even further into a haze of synths, vocaloid effects, and oversharing from an aging rock star? <laughs>